This is Derek Worry. Welcome to GoPro with Derek Worry. I am here in our Las Vegas studios, and uh, we're live on several different platforms. So wherever you're watching us from, thanks for watching. And I think you're going to find this conversation interesting. I know that I'm looking forward to it. Um, we have some top earners here. They're part of our Next Level Mastermind group. They're top uh, high-level earners in their company. And uh, I believe that success leaves clues. So we're going to ask them some questions. They don't know what questions I'm <laughs> going to ask. Uh, but welcome to our show, Brandon and Julia. Okay. Jul Jules? Jules, Julian. What, what do you prefer? Julia. Right. Julia. <laughs> Julia Thornhill. And you, you guys, what, what, what's your hometown? Oh, well, now it's Phoenix. We've lived all over because I was in the Navy for right. 15 years. But yeah. Phoenix, Phoenix right now. You were a Navy SEAL, right? I was. A Navy SEAL. Yeah. Like all something. the stories about <laughs> Navy SEALs and the badassness <laughs> of it all. Uh, some of it, it, some of it's true. Some of it, I, is I like it, to is laugh it a little at bit it. hyped? <laughs> some of it, a little bit too much. You know, it, yeah, it just depends. How many people went into your class to be a Navy SEAL, and how many graduated? So I went through Buds back in 2006. What's that mean? Basic underwater demolition SEAL training. It's out in Coronado, California. Okay. So I think, if I remember right, we started with right around 250 people, and um, we went into Hell Week with right around I think 115, and then by the time we got out of that. I think we finished with like 47. And then the, those that graduated was probably only around 32 people total after that. So after Hell Week, you still lost another 15? Yeah, you're going to lose people because you have, you have Hell Week, which is it's three weeks on a long day. So you have three weeks of training. And then you go into Hell Week, which is you start on um, Friday. You start on, what is it, Sunday night. And then you don't sleep until Wednesday. You get about two hours of sleep on Wednesday, two hours of sleep on Thursday. And then you finish Friday around lunch. And so you'll lose a lot of people during that process. But right after that, so now we know they're trainable, right? Mm -hmm. And then right after that, you go into the second phase portion and it's all underwater. So they got to, they'll have what's known as a pool competency test where they come in, tie up hoses. And so Man, you'll lose quite a few people in that process. I can't do, I can't do like scuba diving, <laughs> uh, even snorkeling. Yeah. I struggle with, I get so claustrophobic from it. Mm -hmm that I just, I, I freaking panic. The, the last time I, I have two uh, like scuba diving experiences, one was a sketchy one with my brother-in-law in Hawaii where he gave me like 30 seconds of training and said, jump on my back <laughs> with an extra respirator. <laughs> oh, no. And so pretty care. soon we're down 40, 40 <laughs> feet down. Um, and then every malfunction in the world happened wow. when I was yeah. at the bottom. And then the second one, is Marina and I were on an incentive trip in uh, the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. That's amazing. And the only thing that got me to go was peer pressure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because everybody was there. Everybody was watching. I was on the little platform. I was freaking out. And then until I finally like, okay, 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 I did it. And I was all right if I kind of forget where I was. And then every time I, I mean, we were connected to, to I mean, I, I had to like burn through a tank in the fastest time possible. The <laughs> like opposite so, of your training. So they're breathing. <laughs> <out of this. laughs> You're like freaking hyperventilating. So like crazy. Do you, do you dive at all? No, I actually haven't, which is pretty crazy. We, we, need, we need to make it happen. Yeah, sure. it's going to happen sometime. But I just yeah. let him do all the crazy stuff. Because she's again. super adventurous. She loves to go travel <laughs> everywhere and then just at the whim say, hey, let's go do this. So. That's the one thing we actually haven't really done yet. You've That's been snorkeling, true. but you've Our first diving. date was skydiving. Um, really? The kickoff of our marriage or relationship. <laughs> wow. So. Yeah, the second date was rock climbing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yep. And I have a buddy of mine who all he does is uh, extreme stuff. He's a doctor, but he does like those squirrel suits. Oh, oh yeah. that's next level. It's like uh, with the Red Bull team in yeah, Europe yeah. jumping off mountains. Yeah, that's serious. That's jumping sketchy. out of airplanes and stuff with, with, the, with the squirrel suits. He's got like... It's a, small little fraternity of people who do that and most of them die yeah yes. i mean he's got like 30 friends that have died i wouldn't yeah, want scary. him doing that by sure. getting too close to a, a rock or something because that's what the whole game is how close can you get to that bridge or that rock or whatever yep. some of them get too close yeah you just keep pushing the limits you know yeah <laughs> you're, you're you're nervous at first and you do it and you're like all right what's next what's next what's that next ridge line right 
you know, and then you, it just, you get too close sometimes and sometimes Man. bad things happen. So anyway, I mean, that's just, I, what I wanted to do is bring you guys in here and talk to you about your network marketing experience and the journey of it. Um, did it start separately and then you guys found each other in network marketing or <laughs> did you did you find each other and then you started your network marketing journey? How did yeah. it happen? We were already married and he actually signed me up without me knowing. Really? <laughs> and how, did that, how was that conversation when you got home? So we lived in Europe for a couple of years. I was, uh -huh. I was stationed over there and Europe was amazing. We got to see what life is supposed to be like in the travel. The problem was is that the military is great. Like we never take it back for anything. It's a guaranteed income. What's the problem with the guaranteed income? It's mm -hmm. not that much money. Right. And so we found ourselves uh, in a situation where we were almost forty thousand dollars in credit card debt. And you're in Europe at this time. Um, at it right started as we're coming to accumulate. Out. Yeah. So Plus just he was gone. Sorry. Good. He was gone about two to three hundred days out of the year. So for us, so you're you the know, military wife. Yeah. You know. I mean, it's yeah. it's not an easy job. You know. But for us, even though we and we were actually both were in the military. You know. Fighting for freedom. You were in the military. I was, yeah. Oh. I was in the that army. That was before reserves. us, though. Yeah, before we met. Okay. So. So you both have the military background. Uh -huh. I don't think I'd fit well in the military. <laughs> I didn't. I, I'm so, <laughs> so, I'm so rebellious uh -huh. in general. I would like. I don't. I think this is a bad idea. I just. I would argue <laughs> over uh, all, all different kinds of things, but uh, or maybe I just, you know. Surrender to the process. I don't know what I would do. You're almost forced to surrender uh -huh. the process. Yeah. You know? And sarcasm does not work. <laughs> no. <laughs> I learned that pretty fast. Hey, it's great though. Yeah. You know, it's... But we didn't have our own personal freedom of choice. You know, yes. we really yearned for that for a, for a while. So. so I was introduced to it because I started seeking out ways to make money. Mm. And I found a friend who was having a lot of success in the military or in, in network marketing. And he introduced me uh, to one of my now best friends, who was one of the top miners in the company that we're in. And uh, I, I saw the vision, I saw the simplicity of the model. I was like, who, why would people not do this? This is right. kind of silly to me. And so we decided to, I well, decided to jump all in. <laughs> we were a little skeptical at first, you know, like there's no way, like how, you know, cause we just- Sounds too good to be true. Yeah, I mean, I was fed with like a plastic spoon, not a silver spoon, you know, right. we both grew up with our parents, very hardworking people, but we just weren't around that type of wealth. So we didn't understand how like I was always told get a good grade good job and, and that's your mm -hmm. path and I'm like okay well I'm 30 years old and all this debt and unfulfilled there's got to be a better way and so it was really just in God's timing it was we were ready for it so this was when 2015 end of uh, 2015 four and a half years ago so four and a half five years ago uh -huh. yeah wow yeah so <laughs> I was working I was I was actually a, a put and how much through. were you making at the time um, I was making about six grand a month in the military Right around and, that. and were you working on marketing? Home? Yep. And how much were you? Earning? Maybe I mean, I went from like six figures and the market crashed, and then literally I was just freelancing and working on different projects and starting another company. Yeah, we just so, moved from the East Coast to the West Coast, so yeah. she was in the process. I mean, we just got to San Diego from the East Coast, so she was in the process of looking for a job. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's so that's true. when I found our company. So we made okay money. But so we you just signed up. You made a family decision. <laughs> you came home and said, you know, guess what, babe, you're signed up. And what, did you, what was your response? Well, I had met him, you know, our mentor now, and I had kind of seen everything. And I was like, but we're in so much debt. Like, where are we coming up with this money? We're going to borrow it, put it on a credit card again. But it so, wasn't a lot of money. It wasn't. But how, at the how time, much was it to, to, to sign you know, up? This is the funny thing. It was, <laughs> yeah, it was like $599, right? $600. $600. Yeah. Bucks. And that's less than the amount of money that we were spending on the bar on the weekend. That's right. true. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. But we, but we prioritize it different, don't exactly. we? Exactly. So, but but still, you know, your mind, you know, clicks through these objections. Ah, oh, you mm -hmm. know, are we this kind of person? Or, you know, can we, you know, we're, we come from a different background, blah blah blah. Right. But uh, were you? Did you? Did you become open minded to it relatively quickly, or did it take a while? No, I mean, I just, I didn't realize how fast it was going to grow. We figured, you know, we made a grand or two in a year or two. That would have been life changing. And then, you know, just started to kick off and we're like, what do we do with all these people? I guess this is working, you know, and, but we had to really grow, you know, as, as a couple. So it was, it, it was relatively fast. It took you about three months and there's three yeah. month process where she was trying to find everything wrong <laughs> with yeah, the industry like really? and, everything. and she actually found your rise in the entrepreneur video ah. and she amazing. was like, wow, this is amazing. Maybe there is something to this. That was an <laughs> aha moment. Maybe, maybe this is a real business. Yeah. So the more I researched it, the more I fell in love. And then we went to our first convention. And that's when I was like, this is awesome. Yeah. And I'm like 
yellow personality dolphin. Like I love the freedom and the lifestyle. So once I kind of saw that and how much we were growing together, I was like, this is really cool. Mm. So mm. it's been fun. So it took you about 90 days to get it up and going. So you had a kind of quick success. Yeah, decent. We, we hit a position that pays out about 6,000 a month within about five, uh, six months. Okay. And, um, and then we, we had to grow. That was kind of that, that point to where we had to grow. And so and let me, let me the, say this, all these numbers we're talking about, they're not typical. They're not, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. they're, they're not a representation of what, what uh, anybody will do inside of network marketing there. This, this conversation is more about kind of the, um, uh, the emotional journey yeah. of becoming a network marketing professional, which is a constant process. Mm -hmm. I've been doing this for 32 years. I'm trying to get better. Uh, you guys have been doing this for five years. You'll be trying to get better you know, 25 learn, years yeah. from now. <laughs> um, but so take that in in um, in in the the way it's intended. Now, when I'm asking this, I'm, I'm not trying to I don't want you to compare yourself and your journey to their journey. Everybody's got their own kind of process uh, in their own way of getting there. It took me. I mean, I made a little bit of money, but it took me three and a half years before it finally sunk yeah. in. And, uh, and I went from kind of amateur status to at least professional intention. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I wasn't a professional yet, but I was intending to be one. So, all right. So six months in, you're kind of making this kind of money. And then what happened? Just we had to grow, you know, being in the military, I had never lead, led women before. <laughs> I never even really worked with a lot of women. So I had to grow. So the best, my best friend at that time was uh, how to win friends and influence people. I had to, I had to study that book. book. Uh -huh. Yeah, man, I had to like take that and not just read it, but study it. Yeah, it's, there, <laughs> there it is. is. Yeah. Yeah, old first edition <laughs> of how to win friends. Uh, Dale Carnegie. I highly recommend it. Mm -hmm. But that's what I just came out of the frame. I know, I know you guys are freaking out. <laughs> and I know I just moved over there. I'm back, I'm back, I'm back, I'm back in my spot. Okay, I'm back in my spot. Uh, so, so this kind of personal development helped. How did Julia help you in, in your rapport with, with uh, the team that had women involved? Yeah, she helped me. Like, she would screen some of the messages that I was sending out, making sure it was just. <laughs> A little Cause, softer, cause, you know, when that's I, all. Being in the military, it's like you're very direct. Hey, just go do this. Get it done. Well, you can't do that here. You're in the people business. You get mm. It's a volunteer army, mm. right? Like they say military is a volunteer army. It is until you get in. Yeah, then it's not. <laughs> right. You know, here in this industry, you have, to be, you have to be able to influence, literally influence people through mm. your actions, through persuasion. your words, through persuasion. Influence leadership, yeah. Yeah, and so I just, she was a big help on, on helping me just understand what to say. Not just what to say, but how to say it. Yeah. Say it the right way. So Dale and Julia. Dale and Julia, yeah. <laughs> I like it. Um, when do you think, I mean, and, and talk to me about your first year in, in this. What was, the, what was the evolution like for you? It was, it was a lot. It was a lot. It was ever-changing. It was very fast-paced. It was, it was exciting, but it was also, I think, in this industry, you know, when you hit a rank or hit another level, there's another devil, you know, another angel, like another thing that you're learning. So, you know, you're always striving for that next rank, that next goal. When you hit it, you have your, your belief increases, right? But also your lessons learned. I mean, I feel like the more income you make, the more fires you're putting out, you know, as, as a leader, which is, which is fun. It's exciting. But when you're working with so many different personality types, every situation is so different and unique. And so I think the first year for us, was learning the industry, you know, just the objections that were out there, us being as skeptical as we were, like even for myself, I'm a professional network marketer. I would never imagine that 10 years ago. I just didn't understand the industry. So trying to figure that out and then really just with just learning with people. I mean, he's taught me a lot too of how to lead, you know, men and just in different circumstances. And so it's been, it's been fun. I mean, we've grown so much in the last four years. I mean, than we could ever imagine. It's changed our whole marriage. The thing that's really interesting about our profession is in a traditional business, let's say the Navy SEALs or uh, working in some company, you learn a skill and then you're done. You just go repeat that skill. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
You know, you fit into the machine, you create a result for your organization, and you just repeat, repeat, repeat. There might be small incremental improvements, but not really. Mm -hmm. It's time, it's tenure, it's seniority, it's politics that moves you through the ranks, mm -hmm. right? right? So inside of network marketing, you get to a rank, and there, immediately there's another rank, mm -hmm. and another rank, and another rank. And in order to get to that other rank, you have to become better. Mm -hmm. So you're constantly being pushed to be a better version of yourself because you can't, I mean, there's one skill set to go from zero to say 25,000 a year, a couple thousand a month. Mm -hmm. uh, there's another skill set to go from 25 to 100. Mm -hmm. There's a third skill set that goes from 100 to 250. There's another one that goes 250 to a million, another one goes a million plus. And they're all different. And you guys have gone through all of those. Mm -hmm. um, and you have, to, you have to kind of employ all of them because you're always working with people brand new. They're trying to get to that, figure that first skill set out. So you come, come down there and basic it out for them, yeah. you know, uh, wh while you're still trying to maintain your million or whatever number you're at um, and helping other people do the same thing. You're dealing with all these different groups all at the same time, and they're all in the same room. <laughs> it's not like everybody's in basic yeah. training and then they're done. You know what I mean? You got basic training next to lieutenant, next next to you know master sergeants, next to four star generals, mm -hmm. all in the same room, and they're all like, you know, how do you talk to them without everybody's somebody feeling either overwhelmed or bored? That's a good point. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's weird what we do inside of our business, but. If you, if you approach it right, you kind of get hooked on this personal growth. At least I did. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I realized that you know, if I became better, I could earn more. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and I could teach other people how to do the same thing. Okay. That's pretty cool. So tell me some of the lessons. Yeah, you, you give me, let's go back and forth on lessons. Okay. Yeah. okay? Uh, lesson you learned in your first two <clears throat> years in building your network marketing business? Give me one that comes to mind. The first one that always comes to mind is ego. I've seen <clears throat> certain leaders who are great in the industry, but they have a little bit of ego that comes in and, and it can destroy everything. I think you, you had a saying <clears throat> in the mastermind one time, you said, sometimes you have to cut the head off the ego, whether it's somebody else or your, even your own, before it gets so big that it can, it can the dragon, the ego, kill the monster. Can kill the baby, monster. Yeah, yeah it can, can breathe fire all over your people. And I think that's perfect because um, ego will destroy you. It'll destroy you, your marriage, your business. <clears throat> you know, and, and even in the even in the military, I saw the the most people who have the biggest egos, from what I've seen, are the people who are just insecure. Yeah, and they're always it's out to try to prove something. The biggest measure of insecurity is is, uh, and sometimes I think ego gets a bad rap because ego is important, it's necessary. It's a sense of self. Mm -hmm. Uh, but when it's misplaced yeah. or it's overinflated or it's, you know, wounded. Um, and what I mean by wounded is they're puffed up like a puffer fish, you know, when that's not necessary. Right. Um, that That's when it can be a problem. There's a great book called Ego is the Enemy, uh, Ryan Holiday. I'd highly recommend that book. It's it's just a... That kid is such a good writer, Ryan Holiday, that it's annoying. Because <laughs> he's young, he's like young like you guys, yeah. and he's just prolific. He just cranks out books. Uh, he wrote "The Obstacle Is the Way," "Ego Is the Enemy," um, "Perennial Seller," "Trust Me, I'm Lying." Uh, there's just another one he just came out with, um, but "Ego Is the Enemy." Wow, is that a good example? Yeah, and I think like you're saying, you just got to be coachable. Like there's so many people in your audience right now that are listening to this and how many people are actually going to go read the book? Yeah. So, you know. 2%, 1%, half percent. Yeah, as soon as I go home, this is all I did. Yeah. Somebody told me to do something, I some, went and Some people it. have been watching this and they're like, oh, this is 10 minutes long. I got to go. <laughs> I, <laughs> gotta go watch Netflix. I have something yeah. I need to scroll to. I need to scroll past these guys. You know, I've been listening too long. The, the, the alarm clock in my head has gone off. I'm, I'm done. So ego, so how did, the, how, did, how did you learn the lesson and what did you do about it? So I learned the lesson actually through, um, I was working with a sideline in San Diego at the time and I, there was this guy who was really good. He was really good. He taught me a lot. So also I also, I learned a lot of things what to do through him, 
but I also learned a lot of things what not to do through this mm. leader. And you know, we just try to apply both. But you know, I, what, I, what I really learned was to make sure that as soon as you see ego, you got to coach it out of your organization. You know, not the negative ego like mm-hmm. we're talking about because we're coaches as well. We're leaders and we have to be willing to set right and left lateral limits of what your culture is going to be. And then you got to uphold that culture or else people will try to tear down those walls. <laughs> it's the absolute truth. And I will tell you, it's interesting you talk about uh, that person that way because a person in my life, I won't name, mention the names, comes to mind, is a, a very influential mentor that was actually very destructive in my life. Mm. Um, I learned a lot from, but it was a very kind of uh, turned into a toxic relationship uh, because of the insecurities, because of the, the, the ego, because of the, I don't know, just bad behavior. But I learned from the bad behavior. I learned what not to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know what I mean? Sometimes you know, they, they, Jim Rohn used to say failure should give them seminars. You know, let me tell you how I screwed it all up, you know, so you can try to avoid those same mistakes. You know what I mean? I I was thinking about writing a book, How to Fail in Network Marketing, just (laughs) list all the reasons, all the ways to fail Mm -hmm. in network marketing just for that same kind of thing. Here's, you know, all those different lessons. But uh, all right, for for you, give me a lesson. Honestly, just, well, for me, consistency online. So when we first joined, we didn't have anyone local. We were in Germany two years prior to that. So we didn't really have like a strong network. So we had to get really creative of just connecting with people, listening. I mean, even though I was in marketing for several years, I never built my own personal brand. I didn't focus on that. So really trying to kind of unlearn all that I knew and just really learn how to connect online and get really creative to build a network from nowhere, from nothing. You know, mm. I mean, I feel like the first two years, we, we went through a lot of just, just like almost like we shouldn't even be here. How did you figure it out? We were pretty determined. I mean, you know, we had great mentors. So we always, we were never like, what do we need to do here? What should, you know, in this situation, just teach us anything. Reading a lot from your stuff, stuff on YouTube, how to deal with whatever network marketing, you know. We were just a a sponge, you know, trying to learn as much as we can with the intent to teach. But those first two years with networking, you know, it was... Well, you you were on every single phone call. You were at every single event. I mean, you were non-negotiable. So... You were a sponge, but you were also relentlessly consistent. <laughs> yeah. And that's, what I think, what people miss sometimes, is just that being relentlessly consistent like you were. Mm-hmm. So um, can we take this conversation away from politically correct and deal politically incorrect? Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. You okay with that? I love it. Absolutely. I'd rather it. So <laughs> t- tell me one thing that drives you absolutely bananas about network marketing. One thing is not your favorite thing that, that you just don't like about it. Honest. <clears throat> Honestly, I, I personally can't stand the manipulation that goes on inside of the industry, meaning the industry is amazing, okay? There's manipulation inside of every industry out there. But there's, pers- my opinion, there's persuasion, there's manipulation. And so people just need to, they need to be able to identify when they see a leader who's talking about how much money they're making, ask them, show me. Mm-hmm. You know, don't, don't just be a leader who hit a rank one time and now you're, you're out there touting to the world, you know, that you're there for that I've been here forever. Cause yesterday's home runs don't win tomorrow's games. We know that. But the problem with the industry is that, uh, there, I think there's way more pros and cons. Again, don't get me wrong. Yeah. It's just, that's the one thing that I don't like. In fact, one of my mentors wrote a book called, uh, Man- manipulated mm-hmm. that's what the 12 deadly sins of network marketing. And it's just kind of calling out certain things in the industry that can be improved. And it's our job, each and every one of our jobs, everybody watches. Does it come from exaggeration? Does it come from insecurity? Ex- exaggeration, from insecurity, ego, and also just trying to make a sale. Like tell people network marketing is hard. Yeah. This is going to, I was actually, my friend told me it was going to be easy. Uh, He's like, hey, this is going to be most easy, people man. Do. do this with me. Mm-hmm. Most it's, people do. And it's not easy. And then what happens is people get mad that, oh, it wasn't easy. They get this fact. Yep. And then they start going around. Word of mouth is great in a positive manner, but it's also bad in a negative manner. So now they start going around talking to your network, saying, oh, that thing they're in, it's just a scam. No, it's not. It's just they told that, me it was going to be they, easy. Yeah, they did it the wrong way. So so what drives you crazy is, is people exaggerating, misstating, or emotionally twisting people around 
in the process. Yeah, just tell them it's going to be hard. You're not looking for everybody. You're looking for the right people. Yeah. And that's you're looking for those ones who have the the grit and tenacity that it takes to win. Okay. What's one thing that drives you nuts? I think just there's so many people that join the industry that really they either don't believe in themselves or they're also dealing with a negative spouse. So they have all that potential in the world and they just, it's like right at their fingertips, but maybe they have it in the person development or they have, they don't have the support system behind them. And I just see some incredible people that were, are born for this industry just get knocked out early. You know, mm. they just don't have the long-term vision. They want to come in, they want to make a million dollars in month one. And it's like, ah, you know, this is a growth process. This is, you know, it's it's fun, it's exciting, but you've got to have that long-term vision. Don't come in and tiptoe and, you know, use it, treat it like a, like a hobby. Really come in with all the intention, go all in and say, you know what, I gave it my all before you throw in the towel. You know, it's just, that does drive me a little bit nuts. <laughs> yeah. I would say the same thing for me is um, watching people sell themselves the two cents on the dollar. Mm. Watching people just accept the tiniest vision of themselves and play so small because they've been programmed to do it for forever. Now, it's the most fulfilling thing is when somebody wakes up from that, you know, mm -hmm. uh, escapes the matrix. But to watch them give up mm -hmm. um, when they didn't need to. Mm -hmm. Is tough because you you invest yourself emotionally into them, mm -hmm. you know, and then for them to let some tiny little thing, it's just like, come on, you're bigger than that. Yeah. yeah. Then they go back to a job that they hate, mm -hmm. you know, working for people who don't appreciate them. All that it drives me crazy. You talked about relationships a bit. Mm -hmm. um, you guys both seem like drivers, <laughs> like hard driving competitive <laughs> yeah. like we have friends uh sami and mandy uh mutual friends that are sane mm -hmm. um and i started like challenging them to like competitions against each other and i found out that was probably not a good idea <laughs> because it became a blood sport i mean it was like they were going so hard um i'm gonna win i'm gonna do this and mm -hmm. you're gonna have to do that and uh all these different kinds of things so we we pivoted into a little bit more nurturing, mutually, uh, you know, supportive thing versus I'm going to beat you. Mm -hmm. um, you two drive me as type A, or strike me as type A, driven, ambitious, passionate. Do you have one distributorship or do you have two? We build one. We have, yeah, we, we build, build one yeah. distributorship. Uh -huh. So am I right in my in my read or is okay. there is there <laughs> yeah we're pretty competitive but we also we we've can, been for, building out for, for one, four we and a half can't, years we can't coach each other so right. if you're married on there find another mentor which is fine but we what i think our biggest thing because we are so competitive and we love what we do so much is we don't know how to turn it off yeah it's so like date nights like phone off not talking about the business being really intentional how do you do that i don't know how to do that. <laughs> Yeah. We're still yeah. learning, Eric. <laughs> I don't know. How. I, I, I just, you know, like, look, uh, I don't, I don't view work life and personal life as different lives. Mm -hmm. I view life as life. Um, so we talk about our baby, we talk about our passions, we talk mm -hmm. about our family all the time. Yeah, all the time. Mm -hmm. So if you ever find peace in that, I don't, I don't feel guilty <laughs> about it. Yeah, I used to. Because other people outside of our profession would try and make me feel guilty. And I found it wasn't just our profession. It was just entrepreneurship. Uh -huh. Entrepreneurs are thinking about their passion all the time. But it's not just entrepreneurship. In the SEAL teams, we go out with the guys and that's all we would talk about. Yeah. The teams or work. or and the, and the, I think some, to be successful in anything, you have to have a level of obsession uh -huh. to be successful in anything. I would bring like a notebook at date night. <laughs> And so, okay, let's, let's, let's <laughs> maybe the notebook. <laughs> I know, maybe you could just draw the line with the notebook. Maybe. But we now we'd bring note cards, like question cards. So then yeah. we kind of, not that we don't always not talk about this at, at during date night, but sometimes it's nice to be more intentional about future stuff versus drawing things out and masterminding and what's the next event we can put on. But we, <laughs> we do do a good job of, of making sure that we're going to marriage retreats. We, mm -hmm. have, a, we have retreats for our team. You know, for all the couples. So, like, that helps mm -hmm, a lot because cool. it gets your focus back into the marriage, too. So, has there ever been a time where it got really funky 
and you know relationship wise in the house and of course like when when <laughs> you're like did, did you have to figure out new boundaries or how did you how did you get to the other side because you guys appear to me i mean at first we know each other's friends that that you're you've got a healthy rhythm we do, but Today. it's also been a lot of work, you know, yeah. I mean, we have, I don't believe in balance, I believe in seasons, you yeah. know, sometimes things are great and sometimes it's like, what is going on? And I think for us, when we're intentional about date nights, communicating, having time for us versus go, 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 you can easily breeze by one, two, three months and you're like, holy cow, where did, where did the time go and where was the time for us? So if we're not spending time, we start arguing about the dumbest <laughs> things. Like I wish sometimes I'm like, we need a camera of the behind the scenes before Zoom because some of the stuff that goes on. Who wins before, the argument? She does. I do. Uh -huh. oh, thanks, babe. I'll take that as a compliment. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's that's called the survival mechanism of every yes. man. Yeah. Every man just needs to learn to yes, okay. Well, <laughs> you win. I will to fight a different fight another day. Every <laughs> smart man will do that. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, when when you disagree with something that your spouse is doing, mm -hmm. I'll start with you. If you disagree with something that she's doing, how do you how do you broach the subject? You mean in the business? Yeah, whatever. If it's in the business, I don't really talk to her about it. I come, I go upline. <laughs> really? I have them talk to her. I might bring it up in a really not in a really nice manner because sure. I've learned my lesson the hard way that you can try to coach them all day long, but vice versa, and it's just it just doesn't work. Yeah. You know, and you can't be a prophet in your own land. And so all I usually do, if it doesn't, if I don't, if I say something that doesn't really work, then I'll just go upline and have one of my third party. Yeah. What are you? Well, he's good. I mean, but he's really good. Like sometimes, you know, if I text something or the wrong way or, you know, just tonality or whatever, I mean, you're pretty good at, at telling me right away. But when it, you're asking when I like come to him and I'm like, hey, yeah. I could probably do a better job. <laughs> It's not what you say, it's how you say That's it. That's you know? true, yes. So, tonality, I guess. <laughs> you know what they say? It's kiss, slap, kiss. Have you heard of kiss, slap, kiss? Yeah, or Oreo, Oreo cookie. cookie. Yeah, same thing. Yeah. That's a good one, though. Like be that. really, really nice. That's and true. And then, like, this, this yeah. thing could be better than really, really nice again, really mm -hmm. quick. Yeah. Make sure that you do, you, you, you sandwich the, the really positive yeah. between the, the critical. Sometimes <laughs> with a spouse, you need, like, three kisses. Double kiss, 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 slap, kiss, 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 kiss. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, all right. Well, good. So in this journey, growing up, did you, uh, I'll start with you, Julie. Did you consider yourself an entrepreneurial type? Probably. I mean, I started like, I made my bedroom into this carnival and I would charge my brothers. They would play with all of their money to win dolls and stuff. I mean, I was always thinking of creative ways to earn income, like lemonade stands, like the traditional stuff. Yep. I mean, we didn't have a whole lot growing up. So yeah, I mean, I was pretty ambitious. I was competitive. I grew up with sports, but I didn't have a whole lot what of- What was the sport? Soccer. Okay. That was my jam. Yeah. Yeah. But I didn't have a whole lot of good mentors, you know? It, it, Where'd well, you grow up? Uh, I grew up in, gosh, everywhere. LA, then finished high school in New York, and then moved since then. Okay. So, yeah. So- um were you a military family too? My dad was actually a pastor. Oh, yeah. Me too. Me yeah, too. Pastor. You know that? So. Mm -hmm. I, grew, I grew up in the church. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, for sure. So we moved around to planning different churches. And okay. So he worked several what jobs. What denomination? Non denominational. Uh -huh. Christian, Same yeah. as me. Mm -hmm. Same as me. Yep. The Holy Rollers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we, we had a, a big church in Minneapolis. My uncle started. And, uh, my dad became associate pastor. So. Nice. Oh, cool. Okay. So you bounced around a bit mm -hmm. with that. Yeah. And were you a good student? Yeah. I mean, I was, I, my grades were good. I was a little rebellious. Mm. I didn't, I was, it wasn't the best rule follower, I guess I would say. <laughs> Typical preacher's kid. Yeah. Yeah. I keep, I keep hearing that. <laughs> Some things, <some> things never <laughs> change. <laughs> and then I joined the military and that was a wake up call. Why did you join the military? You know, I was in New York and my parents had separated and I wanted to go back to California for college. I wanted to get in-state tuition. I didn't have any money coming in, you know, from family or anything. And I thought, man, like, if they can help me with that, I'll learn some things. I thought the commercials were going to be a lot more realistic. <laughs> it was a little bit different. And uh, I just went all in. I mean, I literally joined at 17 and then went, th I was in the reserves and then I got deployed did in 2008. A friend, what, what, did a friend do it? Did he give you that, I think that, I saw that a I think I saw a commercial, honestly. Really? Yeah. And then they, the recruiters would come into school and 
you know, I stopped by a desk one day and they gave me like a pamphlet and literally I was like, this is my ticket out. Because I also grew up in a pretty crazy household mm. once my parents split. So I kind of wanted to get out there early. I almost got emancipated at 16. Wow. So I, for me, it was like, I got to get, figure something out. And that was, that was the best way for me. So, wow. yeah. And so you were in the military how long? Uh, six years. Six years. Yeah. Did you see any active duty? Yeah, I was deployed in 08 into Iraq for a year, 2008. What so. was that like? It was it was interesting. It was tough, but you know someone had to do it, and yeah. I was she actually had quite the journey. That, yeah. yeah, it was it's kind of crazy. Yeah. Well, you have to tell story. me more about that. Yeah, well, it'd be a long story. <laughs> Over okay. a little online. <laughs> <Tell me, tell laughs> if, 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 you, if, if you're uncomfortable, you don't have to. But I mean, I would be curious as to as to. The story, you know, I'm curious. Yeah, it was actually, well, you can tell, you need to There's tell. There's a lot of stories. Yeah. She, she, <laughs> on her deployment. You can start. And then she'll, she's very, she'll, she's, she'll jump she's in. She's very rebellious. Boy. The big green machine. They don't like rebellion <laughs> at all. Um, and so when she was in Iraq, they, you know, it's very easy and for them to start piling up things against somebody if they don't like you in the military. Yeah, yeah. The merit. Type. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so. Slaps, lots of slaps. No mm -hmm. kisses. And yeah. so one thing ended up happening. And um, they try to they try to you know get her in trouble for it, and they ended up being Julia Narvaez versus the U.S. Army. United States of America. Or yeah, sorry, United States <laughs> of America. Big deal. A big court, and she won. She had, they wouldn't give her any proper. It was a two day lawyers, trial. Nothing. They like convoyed. Yes, well, it, they appealed it, which automatically goes to a court martial. But if you do that in Iraq, you're not appointed a lawyer. So I had to study law for two weeks, and they took away my TS, my clearance. And so in that, in the midst of all that, I just had to learn. I basically mapped out because I knew I was, I was knew I was not guilty. So I mapped out how to make sure they tell the truth, even though I knew they were lying. So they said, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. How to get them to tell the truth. And I got the investigator, the investigating officer on like six counts of perjury. Like it was nuts. I mean, it was literally, crazy. it was crazy. I, I that was really right risky. Up. Like I, when I, I remember Sounds I, like a movie. it really was like, I sat down with this lawyer and he goes, I don't think this is a good idea. You should probably just take it. <laughs> but I was just determined. I'm like, I'm not going to go down like this. They just, the, you know, I went through enough harassment to where at some point you kind of draw the line. Yeah. And so I was like, you know what? At, at least maybe I can prove this to so that so it can stop not just for me but for other people. Wow! And so wow. I, I thank God every day for guiding me through that because you know I'd never done that before. So yeah, and she ended up winning. She won the court case, man. I was that's that's amazing. Wow! <clears throat> so you win the court case and then <laughs> you, you you're done with them. Sort of. They actually held um, they actually held something against me. So I was actually. Like we came back to the U.S., I was going back home, and I'll never forget. They were like, "You're not going anywhere," because they had this one th other thing against me, and I was like, "What do you mean?" And so they mess up some sort of paperwork and realize they were wrong. Like they literally should have been with the court, like the first court, but they kept it just in case I won. And but they missed something in the paperwork, and I was like, "You're wrong. Like this is the truth." And like his whole, I'll never forget his whole face turned red. I was, it was like raining and pouring, and they're like, "All right, Sergeant Nervais, my maiden name, you know." send you off and I was like it was it was, it was crazy <laughs> and then I was officially free yes wow <laughs> so and yeah, it's, it's crazy because that whole deployment I was supposed to film a video for the families when they got home but it was so jacked up I actually filmed all the things that were wrong with it on the back end and I handed it over the cd like you know yeah. here's the truth I don't know I'm very like I just I speak the truth. I want the truth. And when I see I people the, taking I want advantage to see the movie. of who, who would you like to play you in the movie? <laughs> oh, gosh. I don't know. I never thought about that. <laughs> it has to be like Reese Witherspoon. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I get that, that a lot. <laughs> that could work. Good time. I mean, we're, we're, she's, we're still extremely patriotic. Extremely. Yeah, you she know. Loves of course, it, but of course. She did go through quite some journey. politics and stuff. Yeah, people go through way worse than when I went through, I'm sure. So. Yeah. Well, good for you. Thanks. <laughs> so, you growing up as a kid, yeah. what were you like? <clears throat> same very competitive tell me about a nine-year-old you <laughs> well i was playing football basketball baseball i'd wrestle you know what was your best was nine sport? years old um i'd say football really i was a cornerback yeah so um growing up i was very competitive when i was in i think my eighth grade year i saw uh, a navy seal like teaser video inside of that socom video it was a little five minute clip and man it got me i was like going i was going to to you're gonna go you're gonna go Right? I didn't even barely know how to swim. 
So my mom worked at Honda, which there was this rec center that had a pool. I didn't know how to do a side stroke or a breast stroke really at all. And I was going to ask these life you know, guards there like, hey, how can you teach me how to do it? And no, no, none of them knew what a side stroke was because it was the, the type of stroke that you had to do to get entry into the program. And so at 5, 5 a.m., I'd wake up, go be at the pool by 5.30, swim for about 45 minutes to an hour every day. And then get to school about seven fifteen. This is when you're how old? I was by my sop my, my freshman year I started doing this. So fourteen. Yeah, fourteen, fifteen. Well, yeah, fifteen. Well, more like fifteen, sixteen. Okay. Yeah, and so then um so then I would shoot basketball for like a cup for like fifteen, twenty minutes and go to school, go to practice afterwards and just repeat it every day. And eventually I so got So nobody pushed you to do this. You were internally driven. Yeah. I when I when I saw that video, I was like, that's exactly What'd your what your parents do. do? My mom worked at Honda Transmission. They they divorced it when I was in the first grade. Okay. So she she taught me what, what hard work's all about, you know. Doing brothers and sisters? Yep. Got an older brother, younger sister. Yeah. My dad was uh he works he, he used to work construction. And your, he was any of your family find their way into network marketing yet? No. Mm-mm. No, 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 they no, still no. think you're the weird one. No, yeah, they're actually probably. <laughs> they're, they're my family and her family they've actually both around. are they, pretty they've supportive. Been, they've been great, yeah. yeah. Yeah, they just, you know, they're I just give them the products, you know. Yeah. Some of them don't them. get it, you know, which is fine. I totally understand. <laughs> yeah. Small so, town. They, they say, you know, people are going to laugh for a while uh, and, you know, and then they're going to, you know, ask your advice later. They don't really ask for your advice later, but but uh, but at least they're supportive. <laughs> well, that happened to her. One of her, I won't say who it was, but one of her family members was extremely negative at the beginning. And then two years in, they actually said, hey, apologize. I'm apologize. I'm proud of you. Oh, wow. Super proud of you. Yeah. It took yeah. them two years, though. So if you're watching, two years. And that was hurtful, but, you know, you just got to, like, know why you're doing it. And That's but, pretty cool. Yeah. So uh, so wh- when did you join the SEAL program? Well, I, I joined to be a SEAL you? at 19. But didn't um, the recruiter lie to you? The recruiter lied to me. My eyesight wasn't good enough. My ASVAB score wasn't even good enough. So I was an ASVAB waiver. It's a test that you have to take to get into the military. Everyone has to take it, yeah. <clears throat> so I went to the boot camp, showed up. I was like, cool, I'm going to go take the test to be a SEAL. And they're like, yeah, you're not on the list. You're not qualified. I was like, what? What do you mean I'm not qualified? I said, yeah, the recruiter lied to you. I was like, oh, well, this is great. I got nine weeks of sitting here. Like, what am I going to do? I don't even know what I want to do after this. And so I, uh, it's kind of funny because right when that happened they had another selection process for like air crew right next door and i was like all right i'll just act like i'm gonna go be air crew and i'll try to sneak my way in so i did <laughs> i act like i was gonna be air crew and actually was able to sneak my way into the other program where they were you know trying to he's determined test for the seal teams <laughs> and sometimes and I took the, the front whole... door is not open you gotta yeah, take the side door take the side door and i took <laughs> and i actually took the test and um you know everything happens for a reason because the guy that i was working with he would have failed the sit-ups by one sit-up, but I actually, I was looking around and I was like, I'll give him, I gave him the sit-up and then he ended up becoming a SEAL. Cra- crazy later on, huh? But then, so I, I, I finished with the test, got a really good score, and then went into to the, uh, the Master Chief's office and he's like, yeah, you don't qualify, sorry, man, but hey, great scores, like go out, get eye surgery, retake the test and come back. And so for a year and a half, I went out to Virginia Beach with the whole purpose of, because that was where the East Coast teams were at. So I was like, man, if I can just get out there, maybe I can meet somebody. And so I did. I actually met this Master Chief SEAL, and he got me. He had to do like a two-month process, like proving to him that I actually wanted it. By you know, I'd work from 7 p.m. at night as a hospital corpsman. I was actually helping deliver babies. <laughs> and so hmm. 7 p.m. to 7 a.m., I'd work all night and then go meet him over at the teams and work out with him for, I think it was about a two-month period. And then he, he got me on the eye surgery list to get surgery faster. Then I went to Bud's. So Master Chief is the, oh, the highest enlisted. Right. Um, I, I, I was at a, uh, an event in Orlando. And there was a gathering of all Master Chiefs, mm. like 50 of them, something like that, 40 of them, 50 of them, all at this resort, just getting hanging out together. Mm-hmm. Interesting. And those are some men. <laughs> you know what I mean? Those are like some manly freaking men. You are not worried about your situation. <laughs> they were just like some tough guys, but good guys. Yeah, yeah. We just hung out and you guys. sang songs and bought them all drinks and thanked them for their service. And, nice. You know, it's a good time. Good time. <laughs> Interesting. Interesting. Strong guys. So let me give the bounce back to network marketing. 
Give me one thing that surprised has. I'll start with you. Okay. So it has surprised you about network marketing. You did not expect an unexpected benefit, an unexpected uh, uh, blessing. I mean, <laughs> the whole thing has been a surprise. I think, honestly, being able to retire him six years early, like I said, for us, we came in trying to pay off some debt mm -hmm. and never in a million years thought, for one, this would be a career like this, too. We would have, you know, the success that we've had and also just all of the growth we've had with our marriage, you know. I mean, like I mentioned, we didn't have a whole lot of mentors. So the mentorship and like that law of attraction, you know, I believe that people are in your life for a reason. So the people that we've been able to connect with and meet and learn from is something that we, in my opinion, we would have never had anywhere else. I mean, that alone was just, it's been a real blessing. You know, I feel really grateful. Yeah, I feel sorry for people that have to kind of live separate lives. Yeah. You know, he goes one way, she goes another. Mm -hmm. That's why you kind of do your own thing, but you can still have your own space mm -hmm. Yeah, if you need to. You know yeah. I mean? yeah. How about you? What's a blessing or a surprise for you? <clears throat> I think the biggest surprise for me was how many people actually need help. Mm. Mm. I never really realized it because I was just living life in the way that everybody tells us to live. And when I got into the industry, I started realizing how many people are hurting. Mm. People who literally would roll up in a Porsche and a Rolex and look like they're so successful and say, yeah, this business makes so much sense. I'm so excited, but I got to come up with the money. And I'm like, dude, what do you mean you got to? $600, a thousand bucks. They're like, yeah, that's why I got to come up with the money because the, I, I make a lot of money, but I spend a lot of money. And I'm just like, man, people, one, there's a lot of lack of education just around money, how it works, how to make it grow it. Um, Two, there's a lot of limited mindsets on things. So, you know, the stories and the people that you can help through this industry, just off of people making an extra 400 bucks a month, $1,000 a month, it's, it's pretty amazing to see. That was my biggest, like, um, surprise, I think, when I first got into the industry. Yeah. What's the next step for you? So what's the next chapter? Look, tell me what the next five years looks like. Well, kids would be, if we're ready for that. Um, Gosh, I think, you know, for us, like the whole marriage retreats for our team was something that we started to do that was really, really neat to see unfold. So I think really kind of expanding on that with relationships. Um, I'm trying to think. I mean, we've had a lot of, we just moved. So we're, I mean, we've just moved twice <laughs> in a month, which has been wild. Yeah. But really just growing. I mean, you know, honestly, just finding more, like your mastermind has been amazing. You know, mm -hmm. it's just like, it's like the, like the bullying point, like it's one degree off. And like, we've had so many aha moments there. So really just immersing ourselves with just more high level people that we can learn from, you know, not just in our industry, but all other industries. You know, I think for us, it's just taking, taking our growth and what we've learned and being able to help people on a bigger scale, but also finding even more networks that we can contribute to, but more so learn from, you know. But let, let me uh, uh, sidetrack before I ask you the same yeah. question. Sidetrack for just a moment. I, um, I we we have a group called Next Level Mastermind that that they just mentioned. These guys are part of it, and this is for six figure earners and above only. In six figure earners in network marketing, or above, the average income in there is probably seven or eight hundred thousand. Um, but we we get together several times a year, and we get together once a week on a, a mastermind call, talking about different topics, and tell everybody. Um, so if you're a six-figure earner or above, or if you know somebody who's a six-figure earner or above, um, you should consider this or they should consider this. Tell, peop tell people why they should consider uh, Next Level Mastermind, in your opinion, as a member. Yeah, I think, you know, you're condensing years and years. I mean, you got 30 years experience in network marketing. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're the godfather, in my opinion. <laughs> and, you know, why would you not invest into yourself, invest into your team to go to a, mm -hmm. to go have an event like that to where you can learn from the best? And on top of that, <clears throat> um, how many people that I've seen, even in the mastermind, top earners who don't have systems in place? You know, in the military, the one thing that we have is called a standard operating procedure for every single thing that we do. And what you've done, Eric, is you've come in and you have a system in place for every single little detail and it makes sure that there's no holes in your pipeline. You not only do you, things not only do you do that, but you also teach them how to coach people, how to produce leadership and make sure there's not this huge leadership gap. You know, these are a lot of things that people are lacking. And I think that 
sometimes people see this massive growth in their business and then it's, it, it stops or slows down because they don't have systems in place or they don't know how to really, you know, lead their, you know, like, like reduce that leadership gap inside the organization. So I think that in of itself is worth every single, you know, dime, every single dollar, every, every, all the time that you've been worth it, it. In your opinion? 100%. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Of course. How about you? I mean, it, again, there's just little things that you just don't think of. You're like, ah, oh, it's that aha moment. You know, one of the biggest things for us, like we didn't really understand the core rank, you know, and, and, for me, I can complicate things really easy with systems. I'm like obsessed. You can ask him. I'm like, my mind goes a million miles a minute. But one thing you just taught is really just to simplify everything, everything on paper, but also from campaigns on social media to events. I mean, I think as an industry, that's how we get better, you know, learning from each other and innovating as things are changing in the world to just be, I mean, the industry is amazing. You know, mm. why, why wouldn't you? So for me, we never want to be the end of the rope. You know, always learning from people, always being humble, always coachable, and just saying, you know what, if that's working for them, like, let's try and implement it and let's, you know, yeah. let's, let's make it happen. No, it's great. And you're great members of it. You bring a lot of value also. Thank you. Um, those that are watching, if you would like to learn more about this, shoot an email to support at networkmarketingpro.com. Put mastermind in the subject line and uh, one of our VIP people will get you the information so you can learn more about it support at networkmarketingpro.com. I want I want to ask you what might be an emotional question. And we don't talk about company names or, you know, yeah. specific products on this particular show, but recently your company went through a tragic event mm -hmm. where the founders and many of the family members died in a, just a terrible um, airplane crash. Mm -hmm. And to lose the heart and soul um, within the organization had to be traumatic. What was that like and, and what has come of it? What has happened as a result of it? And how ha has the organization, because I've watched it, but I want to hear your words. How has the organization um, stepped into the gap? Yeah, that's definitely a heavy subject. I mean, for us, we've had, we have a few founders. So well, fortunately for us, it wasn't all of our founders, yes, yes. Um, but definitely um, it was, it was tough. You know, it was like your father figure, you know, um, and it was, it was a really beautiful thing to see you know, the entire company and teams, different teams just really come together um, to fulfill that, their mission, you know, and from all of that, you know, we we even attracted some great people in the industry, not in, in the field, but in corporate that have really come in and just unfolded those visions that were already in place that we were going to have happen, um, but just really see it come to fruition. I mean, it was it was it was tough. I mean, it was family. You know, it's it, still tough. It, yeah, I mean, it's <clears throat> it makes me emotional thinking you know, of it. They were great people. They had big hearts. Shocking. They were the type of people that, in their hometown. They would just make a call over to the um, the funeral home and say, "Who hasn't? Who can't pay their bill?" Mm -hmm. And then they would pay it, mm -hmm. and no one would know it was them. You know, so they were just very giving, very just amazing leaders. You know, so they would was, just call new people that just joined, just <clears throat> from their you know, not yeah. any rank specific. Just so yeah. But what's happened since? I mean, unification mm -hmm. on all fronts. Um, mm -hmm. There's not really a lot of you know, your team, my team, sidelines, like we've all come together, corporate, the field, mm -hmm. there's no, it, mm -hmm. I mean, we're all 100% transparent. Um, it's amazing to see how many people are bought into wanting for, to fulfill their vision mm -hmm. of taking the company to a billion dollar company. So now yeah. it's just, it's, it's, it's amazing. That's a great way to honor their legacy. Really? You guys are doing a good job with that. Thank you. Um, well, as we wrap up, here's what I'd like you to do. This is your camera right here. <laughs> I'd like each of you to, you know, people watching this, I think they want to have what you have. They want to be a top earner in network marketing. They want to be able to have choices and freedom and options. And maybe they want to work together with the, you know, somebody that they love and care about and contribute to other people's lives, help other people. Um, look into the camera and, and give them your best advice <laughs> as to what they need to do in order to be able to live a better life or or to explore their options inside of network marketing. 
Yeah. You want to go first? Start? I guess you can start. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my suggestion um, is, is you know, everything is mindset at, at the end of the day. And I want you guys to know that I'm just like you. You know, somebody told me that I couldn't be a SEAL. Somebody told me that I, I would never make it inside of this industry. It was too hard. Nobody wins inside the industry, which is false, by the way. Um, so I guess a couple of opinions or a couple, um, you know, just words of, of advice for you guys is don't let people knock you out of the box. And there's so many people who have opinions in life, but how many of them actually have the results to back up the opinions that they're giving you? So you need to be, you need to, there's a saying, you need to stand guard at the door of your mind because people on television, on social media, your friends, your family, there's going to be negative, uh, dr toxic dream stealers that are going to try to knock you out of the box. And you have your own life, live your life. Like don't let anybody come in and dictate how you're going to live your life. So my words of wisdom is just, you know, don't let anybody knock you out of the box. When, when you figure out why you're doing something, it needs to be your North Star that's guiding you. Don't look left, put up a wall right, put up a wall left, don't get distracted. Just go all in. Don't, don't just toe dip your foot into the water. You have to go all in if you're gonna have, you wanna have a successful marriage, you gotta go all in on it. If you wanna have successful, you know, go be a SEAL or go into whatever it is or entrepreneurship, you gotta go all in, you can't toe dip. So don't let people knock you out of the box. Don't toe dip, go all in, be relentlessly consistent on your pursuit. And trust me, my story could be your story, her story could be your story. So many of these people who have had results in life, you know, the results that you're looking for, their story could be your story. I love that. I would probably, well, I'm gonna to talk to the ladies on the call then, um, because I think there's a lot of pressure in just society in the world. And we often find ourselves comparing everything um, from their story in the industry to being a mother, being a spouse. And I just want you to know that your story and your journey is your journey. Every single one of you on here has a gift, something unique, something so special. And some of you on here might have gone through something that you don't wish that your worst enemy to go through, you know, you're, or maybe you're going through something right now and you're really struggling. But I truly believe that we're, you know, we go through things, some, everything we go through isn't what we can't not handle. And I truly believe that what you're going through now, you can show other people how to get through it, through inspiration, through your stories, through your tenacity, and that you truly can. You know, I think women really can have it all. I think this industry 100% allows for that, for the ones that really want to take it and own it and grow and, you know, con contribute. Um, but I think the, the hardest thing for me, the easiest thing for me was, you know, earning income in this industry. But the hardest thing for me personally was believing that I could. And I see a lot of people that they just don't believe soon enough. So I think the sooner that you believe, the sooner you realize why you're doing what you're doing, the, the better the journey, the easier the journey. Um, but just everything will come to fruition in, all in God's timing. So. Well, to both of you, thank you for the conversation. This was fun thank to, be, you. Able this to awesome. be able to chat. And for those that are watching uh, live or replay, if you got value, make sure you share this with somebody that you care about. And um, this profession is not perfect, but it is better. Uh, we, we do have a better way. If you have an entrepreneurial bone in your body and you're not even looking at this, you need to give this another look. Um, this is, these guys can tell you, it's got its ups and its downs, it's emotional, it's challenging from mm -hmm. time to time, but it's better mm -hmm. for sure. So hope you got value. See you soon. And you Bye. guys. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. You're amazing. <laughs> later, guys. later. Bye. <laughs>